Hello, I'm Marlene Saeed. This is Counting the Cost on Al Jazeera, your weekly look at the world of business and economics. This week, Greece's economy is recovering after a decade-long debt crisis. The nation's prime minister has been credited for the growth. But are its people reaping the benefits of its financial gains? Also this week, wealthy nations pledged more than $13 trillion in aid to poorer countries, but the amount was never paid. Oxfam is urging G7 leaders to deliver the money they owe to the developing world. All production cuts by some OPEC Plus members take effect this month, but Iraq's output is at a 20-month low. We spoke to the nation's Deputy Prime Minister at the Qatar Economic Forum here in Doha. Nearly a decade ago, Greece was bankrupt. Today, its economy is recovering. But after years of austerity measures, Greeks' incomes are being hit by the cost-of-living crisis. Voters handed the Prime Minister a victory in national elections, partly because they credit him for that economic growth. Kyriakos Mitsotakis has rejected forming a coalition government. He's called for a second vote in June when he hopes to win a majority. Ume Kulsum Sharif reports. Greek stocks and government bonds rallied after the governing New Democracy Party won the biggest share of the vote in national elections. Finishing 20 percentage points ahead of its nearest contender, the left-wing Syriza party. But the win wasn't enough to secure a parliamentary majority. Conservative Prime Minister Kyriakos Mitsotakis hopes the second round will consolidate his party's victory. The dynamics of the result are more than clear. Citizens want a strong government with a four-year mandate, with bolder changes so that we can quickly cover the lost ground, separating us from the rest of Europe. Mitsotakis was elected in 2019, promising business-oriented reforms. During his administration, unemployment and inflation have fallen, and this year, Growth is projected to be double of that of the European Union average. He's pledged to continue tax cuts, increase investment, create jobs and further raise wages. A wiretapping scandal last year and a train accident that claimed 57 lives in February dented the Prime Minister's tenure. Despite that, he seems to have many voters backing. We hope for better days, especially in the private sector, and we hope Mitsotakis will support it better. We believe he can do it, as previous leaders didn't. Greece's tourism industry is still recovering from the economic fallout from the COVID-19 pandemic, and wages aren't keeping pace with rising costs. It's one issue that the former Prime Minister Alexis Tsipras hopes to capitalize on. Every year, instead of improving, things are getting worse. Things are expensive. Every day, things are getting out of control. It's enough to make you afraid to go to the supermarket. It seems this wind that's blowing in Europe and the rest of the world, this ultra-right and Trumpism, has come to Greece. This is bad news, unfortunately. The election in June will be held under a new law, which gives the winner a bonus of 50 seats in Parliament. Voter turnout for the first round was 61 per cent. If more people cast their ballots next month, the second round could have a different result. Umakulsum Sharif for counting the cost. To discuss all of this, I'm joined now from Athens by Tassos Anastasatos. He's the Group Chief Economist and the Deputy General Manager at Eurobank Greece. Thank you for joining the programme. It doesn't feel that long ago, sir, does it, that Greece's debt crisis and its economic problems, they were strewn across every front page in the world. But they have managed to turn things around in the last 10 years. Well, as a matter of fact, this is very true. Thank you very much for the opportunity you give me to speak on this. Uh, now Greece is on the headlines for all the right reasons. Um, and as a matter of fact, Greece is overperforming the Eurozone uh, after many years in terms of, uh, of growth. Having lost something like one quarter of its uh, GDP during the debt crisis, and uh, with the unemployment rate having peaked at 28% a couple of years ago, uh, Greece was very eager to grow, obviously. Uh, and uh, on top of that, it had to, to deal with the challenges uh, posed by the pandemic and the energy crisis. However, it fared very well. 
uh, it reclaimed all the GDP losses uh, during the pandemic uh, period and now stands uh, something like 4% above the pre-pandemic levels in terms of uh, GDP, has been consistently overperforming the uh, European Union in terms of uh, uh, growth. As I said, the unemployment has de-escalated uh, from 28 to, to 11%. The inflation rate is falling and uh, as a matter of fact, all of this was uh, done amid conditions of uh, a quick uh, return to primary fiscal uh, surpluses. So it seems uh, that uh, Greece is back on the map for all the right uh, reasons. Uh, and uh, I expect that this will soon translate into a, a reclaim of the investment grade as well. So what is driving Greece's economic growth? Many things. Uh, first of all, as I said, domestic demand has been flamboyant in the previous, uh, in the previous uh, quarters. But not just that, exports have been growing. Uh, exports of goods as well as uh, services. Tourism has reclaimed uh, its record uh, numbers of 2019 in terms of arrivals and revenue. Uh, and on top of that, uh, we have the, the factor of the EU structural funds. Uh, I have to remind our viewers that Greece is the highest recipient of uh, funds from the uh, Resilience and Recovery Fund of the European Union, as well as other structu EU structural funds. In the next three to five years, Greece will receive something like 90 billion uh, of resources, uh, almost half of its uh, GDP. And this is going to be instrumental, not just in increasing investment le uh, levels, but also uh, in, in uh, changing the growth paradigm of the country. And okay. allow me to add to that the factor of, uh, of the banking system. The Greek banking system enjoys uh, very healthy uh, balances, very healthy capital adequacy okay. ratios, has improved its uh, non-performing uh, exposure uh, ratios, and it uh, uh, has ample uh, liquidity to support uh, growth. Mitsotakis came to power in 2019, and he promised to bring back Greece's lost children and to encourage small businesses. Has he done that? To a large extent, there have been successes, uh, given, as I said, that growth uh, has returned to the country. Uh, unemployment has been de-escalating uh, rapidly. Uh, the primary surplus uh, came one year earlier, which is an indication of sustainability in, term, in the eyes of the, of the market, which in turn is, is crucial for attracting uh, FDI and investment uh, in, uh, in general. And therefore, progress has been made. Having said that, we have to admit that there are challenges that still uh, remain to be addressed, including uh, trying to reduce the current account deficit, which has increased due, uh, during the energy crisis uh, uh, period, attaining again investment grade, which I expect will happen uh, in 2023, and uh, increasing uh, investment further because uh, the, uh, uh, the capital stock reduction of the previous years is yet uh, to, be, uh, to be replenished. All these, to my point of view, will require an ambitious and front-loaded implementation of structural reforms. Okay, you mentioned the energy crisis. Uh, the Greeks have already had to deal with the human cost of the debt crisis, which was immense then, of course, now there is the cost of living crisis that many people are enduring. Are the gains that we're seeing in the numbers on Greeks' economy and growth actually being filtered down to the real people, the real economy? To, to a large extent, yes, uh, given that, as I said, unemployment has been falling, so more people found, uh, found jobs. Disposable incomes have been increasing in the, in the previous uh, three years. The minimum wage has been increased three times. Pensions have been increased after uh, 12 years. But uh, on the other hand, we have to admit that uh, there are still challenges. Uh, for example, more than 60% of the unemployment rate concerns long-term unemployed people from decaying sectors uh, of the economy. Uh, the number of people at risk of poverty is still uh, high, more than 20% of the population, if we believe the official uh, statistics. And uh, as you said, inflation is increasing the cost of life and uh, especially the cost uh, of housing. So, yes, there is still a uh, job to be done there. You talked about Greece most likely getting back its investment grade status. Why is that significant? To a large extent, uh, it is semantics. I mean, it is a kind of a, a gesture that uh, will, uh, will uh, prove that Greece is back to normality. It's uh, one of the uh, EU countries uh, uh, and it's not the problematic case of the past. But not just that, it's also important for very substantial reasons, including 
uh, containing the uh, the cost of funding, not just for the public sector, which I said doesn't need that much given the favorable structure of the public debt, but also for the private sector. And uh, on top of that is about attracting uh, more uh, more capital for investment. As you know, many uh, many funds uh, have uh, obstacles in, in their uh, in their ability. Uh, to invest in non-investment grade countries and uh, attaining investment grade mm. will, will help such funds with long-term uh, orientation to enter the country again. Really good to get your thoughts. Uh, Tassos Anastasatos speaking to us there from Athens, Group Chief Economist from Eurobank. Thank you. Thank you, my pleasure. G7 countries can find untold billions to fight the war in Ukraine, but can't provide half of what's needed for the most critical humanitarian crises. These are the words of the British charity Oxfam, as it accuses the group of seven largest economies of failing the global south. Oxfam estimates that wealthy nations owe poor ones more than $13 trillion in unpaid aid needed desperately for their development and climate action and it's called on them to pay their due. The charity has also criticised G7 nations and banks for demanding that Global South countries repay the $232 million a day in loans through till 2028, and it wants wealthy nations to cancel that debt. Oxfam has urged G7 leaders to massively increase funding to end famine across the world. It says global hunger has risen for a fifth year in a row, with more than 258 million people across 58 countries currently acutely hungry. It's demanding that wealthy nations meet their pledge of $100 billion annually to help poor countries fight climate change. The charity says carbon emissions from rich nations have caused $8.7 trillion in losses and damage to low- and middle-income countries. Oxfam is pushing for a tax on wealthy people and corporations. It estimates that a wealth tax on G7's millionaires and billionaires could generate $900 billion a year. Well, G7 leaders pledged more than $21 billion to tackle the global humanitarian crises at their summit last week. The UN has appealed for nearly $55 billion. They also aim to secure up to $600 billion in financing for infrastructure projects in developing nations. Aid organisations have expressed disappointment with the outcome. From New Delhi, joining me now is Amitabh Behar, the Interim Executive Director at Oxfam International. Thank you so much for joining the programme, sir. Amitabh, how have you come up with this $13 trillion figure? Can you give us a breakdown? So I, I think uh, it's important to acknowledge that it is really the G7 which owes a debt to the, uh, the low and middle income countries. It's not the other way around. Very often the narrative is that uh, there is a debt crisis, the southern countries owe to G7 countries. So it's really the other way around. And I think we need to shift that gaze and start understanding that it's the G7 which owes a debt to the southern countries. And we've come up with this figure of 13.3 trillion by looking at essentially two components. One is the unpaid uh, aid uh, that the, developing, uh, the developed countries promised in 1970. Uh, and they promised 0.7% of their GNI and they've not even paid half of it. So, so that's one component. And the second, which is almost 8.7 uh, trillion USD, which is essentially about the damages uh, caused by the carbon emissions and for which, again, it's the G7 countries which are responsible. And very often the devastation of the climate crisis is felt uh, by the southern countries. So when it comes to climate aid uh, to developing nations, which rich countries would you say are the worst culprits? We are talking about G7. At the moment, I think uh, the aid that we are looking at is extremely low. So UK was doing well in terms of its uh, ODI, but it slipped dramatically now. Germany is still doing well, but it is now already announced cuts. US is absolutely low compared to the others. Japan, Italy, none of them are doing well. So at this juncture, it's really about recognizing their responsibility. And, 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 and we must really call out this hypocrisy where uh, it seems as if they're doing charity, taking responsibility of the world, but it's essentially 
they owing a debt uh, to, to the de developing countries. What about that loss and damage fund which was established at COP27? Is that a positive step? Oh, it, it's absolutely a positive step. The step is positive, but what we need to see is that, is this just rhetoric? Will we really get the billions of dollars that are needed to have a fund like this be effective? And it's also important to see how the mechanisms are going to be worked out. So at this moment, we need real, real, uh, not just intent, but real action to back, back uh, the intent. In your report, you make comparisons to Ukraine and accuse G7 nations of, and I quote here, deadly double standards. Why do you think these double standards exist? These are, you know, this, as, as I already said, these are clearly double standards where they're talking of their global responsibility. And then you're looking at wanting debt repayment of almost 230 million on a daily basis for the next five years, which will essentially go to the G7 coffers and their rich bankers. And this is the money that could have been used in making investments in health, in education, gender equality, safe drinking water, which could completely transform uh, the low and, and, and middle income countries. So there, there's clearly a, a hypocrisy that we see. And at this juncture, we need to uh, change that, that, that discourse fundamentally. At the G7 this year, we actually saw some nations from the global south sitting on the table. Do you think these countries do enough to push their own agenda? I think it's important to acknowledge that to bring a few uh, leaders from uh, the non-G7 countries largely as photo opportunities is not going to uh, shift the responsibility. It is about the G7 taking responsibility for, for what they're responsible for. And it is like what we've talked of, the poly crisis that we see at this juncture, the poly crisis, which is in terms of the food crisis. This is the first time we are seeing now in last five years, uh, hunger growing. Almost 300 uh, million people in this world sleep hungry. Uh, you have the fuel crisis, you have the inflation and cost of living crisis, you have the massive climate crisis, and G7 which is, which needs is to, to be fair, also, money. which to be fair, sir, is also uh, something impacting developed countries, not just poor countries. Absolutely, it, it is. And, and that's where I think we need to shift the gaze that this is really not about continuing with an economic system, which is essentially going to. Uh, uh, further line the, the pockets of the super rich and the billionaires, but addressing questions like climate head on. I know one of your ideas is taxing the rich, a wealth tax, and the popularity of, of this idea has grown in many countries over the course of the pandemic. Do you think this is the solution in, in helping developing nations? Absolutely. I, I think it's, it's, it's important for us to recognize uh, that the wealthy need to be taxed. I'm happy that some uh, super rich themselves are now talking of, of more wealth. But if you just do, just in the, the G7 countries, a 2% tax on the millionaires and 5% on, on the billionaires, you'll uh, get 900 billion USD. And, and this, as you said, is, I would say, a growing momentum. You have now, whether it's in Colombia, Spain, Norway, where you're now already looking at a wealth tax. Uh, President Biden is talking about it. So I, I think there's, there's momentum, there's, recognize, there's recognition that these levels of inequality, obscene inequalities, are unacceptable. And, and I, I think it's important our, our Oxfam report again and again points out at the obscene inequality and how it's growing. We need to also see that in, in the last 25 years, this is the first time uh, when you're seeing extreme wealth and extreme poverty uh, grow together. So this is about bringing more money uh, into with the governments. This is about then spending that money for climate action, for public education, for public health, for safe drinking water. Let's hope for a better future. Good to talk to you. Amitabh Behar, the Interim Executive Director, Oxfam International. Thank you. Thank you. The world's biggest oil producing nations surprise markets when they announce plans to cut oil production again starting this month. The supply issues were then compounded by delays in Nigerian oil shipments and a halt to some of Iraq's exports. 
We spoke to the Iraqi Deputy Prime Minister and Oil Minister Hayyan Abdelghani at the Qatar Economic Forum here in Doha about his nation's output. Iraq is committed to the agreement with OPEC. Iraq can export larger quantities than what is being exported now. And Iraq can produce more quantities of oil compared to what it produces now. But Iraq is committed to reducing production to keep the unity of OPEC. Iraq is committed to reducing production in two stages, the first of which started in last December to produce 200,000 barrels of oil per day. The second comes this month, where there is another reduction according to the voluntary agreement, so as to preserve the stability of the global markets. Oil production in Iraq's Kurdistan region fell after Turkey stopped extracting oil from the region to its Jehan port in March. The halt followed an arbitration ruling by the International Chamber of Commerce. The ICC has ordered Turkey to pay Baghdad more than $1.5 billion in damages for unauthorized exports by the Kurdistan regional government between 2014 and 2018. After the Paris court's decisions, we held negotiations with our brothers in the Kurdish region, and it was agreed that an oil marketing company, which is subsidiary to the federal ministry, would handle the region's crude oil exports. Four contracts have been signed with the company to sell the region's oil. The Turkish government was informed on the May 10th by the firm which operates the Iraqi-Turkish line about our readiness to resume export flows. The brothers in Turkey informed us that some inspections of the pipeline system are being made to ensure its safety and suitability after the recent earthquakes. We are still waiting for the final response of the Turkish government. Among the topics discussed at the forum was the future of economic growth in emerging economies. The sharp rise in interest rates, particularly in the U.S., has often triggered financial stress in those markets. The IMF says many countries have proven resilient to the tightening monetary policies. We discussed that with the co-founder and managing director of the Global Council. The era of free money, which has come to an end in the West, and in the and in the developed world is clearly having a knock-on effect in the emerging markets. Some of them are weathering that storm better than others. Those that have a strong domestic economy, that have a decent export platform, have been able to weather the storms. Others, relying more on imports or with more fragile domestic economies, have clearly been impacted. How are they doing that? You'll see at the moment you have um, uh, Ghana recently successfully renegotiated their debt provision at the IMF and you have other countries like Zambia who have been in the same process for two years. How are they able to get through that? With some difficulty. Food price inflation principally has had a major effect in sub-Saharan Africa. The most recent IMF study suggests that GDP re in real terms will be impacted by about 4% down because of the increase in food inflation which is ranging between 30-40%. The reasons for that are a combination of the energy price shock because of the war in Ukraine, but also the increase in labor costs, which has obviously been folded, in, folded into food prices uh, following the end of the pandemic and the way in the, which the world has come back to normal. What are the consequences? Household budgets are being squeezed. You have uh, significant pressures on the domestic economy. And in some areas, you now have major political instability and change. The global slowdown which we saw during the pandemic and then to some extent has been exacerbated by, by the war in Ukraine is going to take a long time to ease out the system. You're going to have to see interest rates rising as a result of some of these challenges and you're going to see a significant impact on domestic uh, household uh, economies. You're going to see savings come under pressure. The long-term consequences of this will that you will see a restructuring in, in, the, in those relevant economies. You will see a um, potential increase in, un in unemployment, which you're already seeing in some markets. New economies and new industries will emerge, but it will take time. And that is our show for this week. Get in touch with us by tweeting me at Marlene Saeed. Do use the hashtag AJCTC when you do. Or, of course, you can drop us an email. Counting the cost at aljazeera.net is our address. 
And there's more for you online at aljazeera.com slash CTC. That will take you straight to our page, which has individual reports, links, and entire episodes for you to catch up on. That is it for this edition of Counting the Cost. I'm Marlene Saeed. From the whole team, thanks for joining us. The news on Al Jazeera coming up next.